Hello and welcome to Thinking Deeply About Primary Education, the vlogcast that gives you a peek inside the minds of some truly inspirational teachers. During this episode, I sit down for a chat with Neil Almond, a teacher and curriculum expert in London, who shares his experience of teaching and leading in and around the nation's capital. We discuss his acclaimed chapter in the Research Ed Guide to Curriculum and what he sees as the essential behaviours of school leaders wishing to develop a high quality curriculum. Whether you're new to teaching or a school leader with tons of experience, then this interview is a must listen. And if you happen to be listening on your preferred podcast provider, don't miss out on the extended cut in which Neil takes on the foundation topic tier list, ranking some of his favorite foundation subject topics. Full interviews are available from the Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics YouTube channel or thinkingdeeply.info, where full show notes and references can be found. And without further ado, let's spend some time thinking deeply about primary education. So Neil, it's great to see you. Thank you very much for coming on. How's things? Thanks for having me. The, the start of these, we always start with uh, some questions about the, the teacher in numbers. And so you can only respond in numbers. I'm going to give you some rapid fire uh, questions. So the first one up is years as a teacher. Seven. Number of schools? Two schools, one trust. Last year group taught? Six. Chapters in the largest bookstore in the north of England? <laughs> just the one. What is the largest bookstore in the north of England? It's just a Waterstones. Nice. Just just a Waterstones in Manchester. Still, that's that's, that's impressive. And um, blog posts. Fifteen rambles, one non-ramble, one guest post. Blog hits. As of when I wrote this down, thirty-six thousand seven hundred and twenty-nine. Gee, that's, that's impressive. And tweets. An ashamingly large amount, 17.5K. Oh, 17. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, is, that is immense. <laughs> I think they include retweets and replies to tweets in that as well. So I'm saying that to make myself feel better. That I've, yeah, I think I've been on Twitter about three years now, so... I don't do the maths on that one to work out how many <laughs> tweets per day that averages out because I'm sure that will shame me. No, I think I think you're right. If they, if they include retweets and likes, then uh, that, that takes a lot less time to to do. Um, so I think with 33,000 plus blog hits, um, a lot of people will be familiar with your your work already. But I think, can we start with, like you're the assistant head of teaching and learning for trust in the southeast. Yeah. Tell us about your journey as a teacher and how you got here. Oh. So teaching was always something that I knew I wanted to do. I always wanted to be a teacher and even to this day if someone said what would you do if you weren't a teacher, I would have very little idea as to what I would respond with. So with that in mind, I went into it thinking what's the quickest way that I could get into teaching and that was a three-year BA degree of primary education because that came with QTS so you wouldn't have had to do the years PGC at the end of a, a normal degree. That was an interesting experience. Teacher training, um, certainly so I started in 2010. I'd say it was a three-year course so it was still in that well-known phase that we kind of take the mick out of now I think when it comes to teacher training so I left there feeling woefully underprepared for uh, you know, actually teaching you know being responsible for 30 children in terms of what I was doing it's very much learning styles you know engagement and edutainment over actual meaningful learning you know, even though, you know, 2000, and, as I say, 2010 to 2013, so you had things like Willingham's Why Don't Children Like School came out, I think, in about 2010. So you'd like to have, you'd like to have thought, you know, the university lecturers there would have been engaging with that kind of thing. And, you know, second year, third year, they might have said, oh, by the way, you know, read this book. It's quite interesting. But no, it was another three or four years after I graduated before Daniel Willingham 
you know, came into my life, as it were. So after uni, uh, and I don't think many people know this part about me, I had a little stint in an art school in Wembley, and I had a a woeful experience. It was absolutely terrible, just because I think it was so different to, um, you know, what uni had prepared me for, the experiences I had then. I mean, you know, they were throwing you know, Douglas Mov at us from September and I was there's just that cognitive kind of distance between what I'd learned in uni and what they were presenting in, you know, teach like a champion was so vast and so great that by Christmas I was asked to leave wow. because I wasn't doing a uh, a particular good job of it. There was, you know, loads of reasons as well and other things going on in there as well. So, yeah, I had a little bit of knockback and, you know, really had to kind of then think about, is this really what I want to do? But then going back to what I said, I don't know what else I want to do. So took a couple of weeks off, you know, re-engaged, um, sorted myself out, prep talked myself up a little bit, did the old, you know, supply just to build up the confidence found a really nice school where, you know, excellent deputy head at the time, you know, took me under his wing, you know, mentored me up. So I was there, I think, from, I think I did a whole summer term there and then a job came up, interviewed for it there for a full-time role for the September and I got that. So I then spent six years um, in a school in North uh, West London near Paddington, which was a really, really great school really good people when you look back on it now you know just really really good solid no frills teaching so I was there for two form entry everyone who was there you know was quite you know far more experienced than me so there was no kind of leadership opportunities and I was starting to you know wanted to dip my toe in and kind of see what that kind of things were like and then after about three or four years there, my then partner and I, we moved to Kent, which gave me about an hour and a half commute either way. And it was kind of at that point where I was like, I can either use that hour and a half to, uh, you know, watch Netflix and, you know, be one of those, you know, zombie commuters or, you know, use it for professional learning. And from there came the... Uh, you know, the Mr. Button Mass podcast. So I was quite fortunate that I was able to get through, you know, two a day pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas some teachers take a whole turn to get through just one. And that was just like such a massive penny drop moment for me. And yeah, I just felt angry at kind of what I, I had been doing before and what kind of I had led, what I was led to believe was good teaching from you know uni and training up there because it literally just threw everything in the uni's interpretation of constructivism and just turned it on its head completely and from there you know you listen to things and you book recommendations so right I, I was never a massive reader and I never have been a massive reader in terms of you know uh, fiction which I suppose, you know, as a teacher admitting that is I'm going to get chastised massively. Um, but there's just something about educational books that just really kind of, especially at that time, 2018, where, you know, John Cat were really starting to produce high quality, high quality books, you know, cognitive science applications uh, in the classroom. And so, you know, part, it was and then a mix of, right, I'll do a podcast on the way up to work and then I'll read a couple of chapters of a book back from work so I was getting through you know books left right and centre and then you know right I can manage the books now let's go to the original source so let's read some of the work from the Bjorks let's read some stuff from you know Kushner let's read you know the content below theory papers all of that kind of stuff which then just opened my mind to you know different ways of doing things then saw you know there's these things on Saturday called conferences and there's this one called Research Ed Okay, I know I'm not, uh, I'm a bit of a introvert. I like my own company. I don't really, you know, go out and make too much of a song and dance about myself. You know, okay, but I'll, you know, push myself out there, go to one. I'm trying to, I can't remember what my first one was. I think it must have been 
Surrey, I think, maybe one Surrey, potentially. But yeah, those were just, and then you know, the quality of the CPD you were getting there was just like, wow, this is what CPD actually looks like. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> <laughs> and it was just teachers who were just interested in kind of the same things that I was starting to get interested in. And then from there, you know, blogs came on and I started to feel like I had something to contribute. And it got to the point where the commute was getting a bit too much for me. So it was like, right, okay, I need to find other other job opportunities. And I say the, the deputy head who then became the head, you know, was really good. And I was very open and honest with him. And I said, you know, I'm not going to be here next year. Can I put a tweet out saying, you know, I'm looking for a job. What, you know, what have you got for me? And yeah, the amount of replies and responses I got through that was, you know, amazing. And that's where I currently found my current role, which started off as a lead teacher in this uh, small academy trust of, say, just four primary schools. We then had, was the idea was then, you know, go in, teacher improvement. So that would be things like actually, ironically, <laughs> taking new year teachers who had trained up through those Douglas mob kind of techniques and things like that, you know, the same thing that I was like fighting against. And I was like, what are these all about? Uh, we then had a, so that was in 2019, in the second or third week of that September term, so two or three weeks in the new job, we, um, one of the schools had an Ofsted report under the new framework. And I think the, uh, you know, the Ofsted's thoroughness of looking at that school's curriculum made people, not senior leaders within the school, but higher up at that trust level, realise we need to do something about curriculum for the other schools. Um, thankfully, curriculum was one of my big areas of interest and still very much is. So by about October, they just said, what do you need? How long do you want? We want a curriculum written by, I think it was the end of the academic year. Okay, we'll give give it a go. No mean feat. Um, whilst doing a bit of teacher improvement as well. So it was like three days a week working in an office, writing curriculum, two days supporting teachers. Then Corona happened and then it was just take out, um, obviously lockdown, work from home, just create a really strong, effective curriculum. So that's what I did up until last year. And now this year is really kind of looking at the implementation of that curriculum within the schools and more of the teacher improvement kind of thing as well. And that's where I am right now. Nice. I think uh, a lot of people can probably resonate with the, the beginning of your story. Um, yeah. Because I remember the first two years being really tough. And I think I was probably four or five in before... I read things, you know, like you said, by William, by David Die Die. Um, I think we're a lot more fortunate now in terms of, as you say, with the books that are available, you know, because they're making quite complex ideas really accessible for teachers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so I think teachers who are starting now are reasonably fortunate in terms of that bank just keeps building. Um, you know, and so if you did want to spend your commute reading, there's actually quite a lot of supplementary material. You know, for instance, you could read Doug Lamov and then read um, Tom Sherrington and they would complement each other, you know, I think reasonably well. But uh, Very well indeed. But more, more power to you because I've always wondered um, you know, how you came to know so much about so much. <laughs> um, and, and now I totally understand if you're spending three hours a day. <laughs> you know. Three hours a day for what was it, been about two years, yeah. Yeah. It's just time. I just made. I just made time for myself, and I was just very fortunate that I say. And I think that's you know, time is the best resource that we can give teachers. And I think leadership is all about giving teachers that time to focus on teaching and that professional learning that they can do whenever they can. Yeah, hundred percent. Because you know, you you never finish learning. You know, even though. No. I've written books on maths. There's always something I want to put in because, oh, I just learned this. Oh, no, <laughs> it's now, I, I really want to update that, you know, even days after. Um, <laughs> days after it's been published. <laughs> well, can, we, can we just change that chapter? Um, 
you know, um, and I think there's a real joy in that kind of development, especially when you're allowed to almost have some input into what it is, you know, because obviously I'm, I, autonomy is important. And I know that sort of leaders quite often will be more expert than those who they're leading. And so direction is, is essential. But, um, but I think there's if, if someone said you can focus on one part of your craft and then you get a choice, I think that can be a really empowering and enjoyable experience rather than when I started teaching, you would go out for the day um, and you would have no control over what it was no, that you were not at all. In. And, you know, as Becky Allen says, 50% of the time, it was a total waste of money and time. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, I can actually remember going on like my first external maths course. I went there with my deputy head. And I think by the afternoon, he just said, we're going. <laughs> we're not We're not getting anything from this at all. And I think we went to the pub and had a beer. And <laughs> yeah, I, I've definitely had that experience with head teachers in the past where it's like, okay, we've, we've seen enough uh, time to go. And you're so relieved. You're like, yes, thank goodness. Because you yeah. want to stay because your boss is there. But <laughs> yeah, when the boss says, we're not getting anything from this, I say it's a waste of time. You could be doing things that, you know, far more productive. Yeah, I think, like, I hope we're turning the corner. Things like research ed, where you can choose to go on a Saturday, you know. I, I think so. I think um, the way that some schools manage it, obviously they can't directly say you have to go to these, but if you do go, we'll pay for your ticket and, you know, give you a day at some point. I think there's a really reasonable, meaningful way to... Uh, to go about it 100 yeah and it, it it doesn't break the schools bank either because they're really affordable in terms of price and there's actually a bit of a disparity between the quality you receive and the fact that you're say paying 50 pounds for the national conference in london yeah you know, and it's it's amazing because you could you could spend thousands on something with no impact you know but, um, but touch wood i think uh, i think we're moving in the right direction and so hopefully fewer teachers will have to learn on the hoof like so many have had Absolutely. to before so I think there's the amount, no, the amount of quality online recorded, you know, research at home and research at Loom and, you know, the profession really has taken it upon themselves to record high quality stuff that, you know, you don't even need to go to these if you don't want to. You could just say, right, you know, hour, hour and a half after school, we're going to watch this, watch this one. Let's discuss it afterwards. Think about uh, implementation. And, you know, it would be better than half the stuff that they've done before. Yeah. Um, At no cost to anyone whatsoever. No, yeah, especially the ones that are available for free. And thinking about, like, because I've really benefited from this, because with the kids, Saturdays aren't great all the time. You know, I make an effort to go to the ones that I really want to go to. Um, But, for instance the maths conference run by LaSalle, they're normally quite far, you know, they're spread around England so that everybody has a fair chance. But being able to go to the yeah. last one, you know, virtually, it meant that I could, you know, I, I've literally spent an hour over a couple of days watching, you know, the ones that are pertinent to the maths in primary school. And, you know, it's been fantastic. Um, and and, and yeah, it's absolutely not that expensive, you know, what, £84 for the year, I think. Um, Something like that. And then you just get, you get them. They're there, you know, it's, you pay. I, I've never been. I never went to a LaSalle math conf, but I know they're high quality. I know Mark McCourt. You know, he's only going to put the highest standard things on. But to have, you know, when we think about, you know, when you go to a conference, it's transient information. Once you've been, unless the quality of your note taking is fantastic, you're going to forget half of that anyway. So the fact you have these, you know, on demand is and should be a game changer for teacher CPD going forward. So in, in terms of in the classroom, what are the four most prominent features of a Mr. Almond lesson? And I know that actually you've got quite a big interest in reading, phonics and mathematics and the rest, the sort of wider curriculum. So you could choose to interpret this in different ways. Yeah, you. this was a really, I think that's one of the annoying things about my personality is that I want to be an expert on everything and I can get quite attached quite quickly to the things that I never thought I'd have much interest in like the reason I've never taught in key stage one or you know early years so 
I shouldn't really have you know as much passion for phonics teaching as I do but I just remember I was going into a class in um in one of our schools it was a year three and their phonics was dire and yeah they just could not decode and so my job my my role was to then you know right okay so what can I give this teacher and it wasn't the teacher's fault she was brand new this year group had a really rough year they I think they had you know a teacher a new teacher pretty much every term for, for year one and year two and so this teacher that I was happened to be with at the time I was like you know what do I do with them um and you say by year two you know we were at that point now where we're not um learning to read we're reading to learn at that point and these kids were far from ready from it so I went back and I say I just tried to digest everything and everything that I could about it and yeah it started off this I like to think a bit of friendly competition between me and Chris about reading and you know <laughs> but I'll say that it's the way I think I've gone about this given your background and everything you know I've gone for a maths lesson and thinking about what was in a, a Mr. Armand uh, maths lesson. Because I think, again, one of the dangers I think we have is to try to codify things too simply. And that's what some things aren't appropriate for a maths lesson that would be appropriate for, if we get to this kind of tick sheet behaviour, mm -hmm. then, you know, that's when that's when the the lethal mutations kick in and everything like that. And someone comes to me and says, well, I tried to do that in the history lesson and it didn't work well. It doesn't work in a history lesson. So this is, would be prominent features of a maths lesson. Um, rightly or wrongly, I'll always start my lesson off with a bit of retrieval. I know um, you get some teachers who say, well, when, you know, when is the best place for retrieval? Does it have to happen at the beginning of the lesson? I don't think it does have to happen, but um, I tend to put it there for reasons of you know it's just a settling down I was reading um Pepsi's motivation book and you know that idea and I think again the common message at university was um motivation breeds academic success whereas his book is very much no you get that kind of motivation from having that success first so knowing who I had when I was in the classroom the first kind of two or three questions quite straightforward quite simple so that kids were again coming in and those first, you know, two minutes of that lesson were, I'm being successful right now. So deliberately kind of planned that way. Within that starter towards the end, I'll also have um, some pre-test multiple choice questions on the content that we're about to, that I'm about to teach them which some people think, well, why, why on earth are you giving them questions that you know they're not going to know? Um, the reason for that is because we're starting to see some research that kind of suggests um, the power of pre-testing children with multiple choice questions. So this idea that we're cognitively preparing them for what's about to come, and that's going to increase the engagement and how much they learn. Um, I don't know if you're at the point where you're do, doing show notes, but I can gladly just send you the paper and they can go in the show notes. And I find I find that kind of interesting because at the end of the day, it's something that doesn't take, even if the benefits are minute, it's not something that will take a lot of teacher time. So therefore it's something that um, I think teachers can do and probably should do. Uh, that's going back to the ideas of, um, you know, Hattie's visible learning where, um, Hattie would say, you know, he's only going to focus on those things over you know, 0.4 of an effect size, whereas William was saying, well, actually, I'd be doing all those little things that are worth a little bit because they will build up really quickly for not much time or effort either. So I liked that kind of thinking about it. Uh, second kind of feature is definitely the uh, I, we, you kind of way that we model things. I'm a big proponent of... Um, silent teacher so this idea that um if the listeners aren't aware because of the way working memory is structured with the uh, phonological loop if we're narrating over our instruction that will kind of conflict with students internal monologue about what's happening and what's going on here 
So I'd always kind of model three examples. That first example done completely silent, done at about half the pace of what it would normally take me to actually work it out. Uh, the reason for that is kind of demonstrating to children, this is something that you can be fluent in. It's cognitively demanding to begin with, but there is an end point and it kind of looks like this. The second model would be still um, silent, but what I'd be doing is drawing children's attention to various things. So um, I recently retweeted the blog I wrote about um, how I used to structure my maths lessons. And my thinking's come a little way on since then. Um, it was very much my kind of uh, journey into mathematical ellipses wasn't as uh, far as it is now and I am as I say I'm ashamed to say that that is public evidence of me teaching uh, multiplication of, of fractions by a whole um, number without manipulatives was, so was, you can was that uh, your talk at the research research at national conference and it was one of my talks at one of the research it was when my talk at the research at national and I think we had a uh, Debbie Morgan, now Debbie Morgan OBE, was in there, I think. And uh, Peter Matter, author of uh, Visible Learning, was there. And here was me, like, I managed to teach them the procedure of how to multiply. But I think that just, you know, shows even, you know, people at Research Ed, you know, we're still learning, we're still on this journey. We're not saying we have, you know, we have all the answers and, you know, we've finished. We're still learning. And I think the principles of what I was saying will still hold true with manipulatives or not. So what I would kind of do would be um, I would tap certain things. So I would, um, again, if we're thinking about it as a procedure, I'd tap the numerator, I'd tap the multiplication symbol, I'd tap the whole number, and then I would write whatever the answer would have been so that children are seeing, all right, that kind of connections there. So you're just drawing their attention to those little things, making sure that, that working memory is where it should be. You know, I was the, going to say, um, that there was, there was a lot of great stuff in that talk and it's almost impossible to cover absolutely everything in a 40 minute session, you know, for, and I think in my experience, it's much easier to exemplify ideas you when everything else is stripped back, you know? So I yeah. think if you try to, impart the, the rest of the key points, plus look at structures and say people weren't familiar with the structures or the representations at all. I'm not sure you would have been as successful in sort of, you know, in given these sort of fundamental principles for a lesson structure. So I, I don't think you should be too hard on yourself at all because I, I remember coming back from that talk on the yeah, that was, that was a that was a smashing talk and yeah. yeah thank you very much. Yeah, but I, I, yeah, in, in my experience, I like to keep the maths really simple when I'm introducing a new sort of pedagogical idea. Yeah. Because the the color and the the additional sort of knowledge, you know, bank that we can draw on, I think they need their own time dedicated, you know, specifically to them, you know. And yeah, you know, that's just that's just my opinion. No, and I think for teachers, particularly I think primary school teachers because of the pressures that are in the system, whether we like it or not, you're not going to be an expert of manipulatives straight away. And, you know, you've got to choose something, I think, with the biggest, highest leverage. And I think giving them a, a structure that they feel safe and comfortable with and actually, you know, potentially could improve teacher learning. Give them that first and then throughout the year roll out all the manipulative structures. And then that's just something that they can go back and include within that lesson structure that they have. So yeah, yeah. it's like I was looking at reading through that blog again and I was thinking, yeah, actually like the principles, everything I was doing would have worked just as well with and actually say the next level of that, the improvement of that would have been around with these examples. Let's throw whatever it is, quiz or you know, fraction bars to show that what's happening. None of that is fundamentally different it just enhances what's already there it's you know that extra je ne sais quoi exactly i think that it's almost because you can see your blogs and i know you've done some guest ones for third space so say you started with that blog and then you tried to sort of improve your practice and then if you came to the most recent ones where you're exploring those structures 
And yes. you're almost on that journey. You know, you need about five years to really have a, pro- a proper go at improving your practice, I think. And, you know, bit by bit. So I, I think that, you know, the journey's there. And if someone were to start yeah. at the start and then build up, you know, because I've had four years and each step I take with my teachers um, is a little bit further on than the, than the previous step. You know, there's no expectation that they can do literally everything that I want them to do. But no. just to choose, you know, to be a little bit more effective in one area and then and then we build and build. And then, you know, before you know it, four or five years have gone, but I see you're operating at a pretty high level. Again, I was at the beginning of my kind of learning about, you know, working memory and the importance of attention. And so I was thinking, you know, what can I, if I'm doing silent teacher, there's a lot of, ways that that could go wrong in that you know kids might switch off and so I was thinking you know what can I do to actually keep them on their toes a little bit and also as I say you're just really kind of wary of that cognitive thinking that the kids are doing so once they've seen that first example they are thinking or where did that eight come from or whatever it may be. So that's why in that second example, I'm sure them really clearly. And then there might be a quick, you know, thumb, hum, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, just really kind of quick stuff. Do you understand like where I got that from? Fine. And I really like the way you're thinking about the silent teacher because, you know, it's one of those things you explain to people and then they say, well, does that mean I only do it or do, you know, do our, all our instruction in sound? And I think it, it's about making it right for your decision-making process and thinking, do these children need to see me doing this? You know, because you're almost looking for that level of mimicry, you know, that performance, yeah. who, who can mimic this process um, before develop, delving in. And um, yeah, so I think if if anyone listens and they're thinking, oh, well, I'd quite like to try that, uh, you know, I think you're right. There's no, there's no right answer, but um, as you've described, I think draws attention to the reasons why you would use the silent teacher in a, in a primary manner. Oh yeah, and I was always really upfront with the kids. Like, <laughs> I've been learning something new. This is why I think it might work. We're going to try it. And so I, you know, always upfront. I remember giving the kids, you know taking them through, um, you know, William's simple model of the mind. And I was like, when you're learning like this is what's happening. I actually, you know, I know there's that whole debate learning how to learn kind of stuff, but I think the kids actually took quite a lot away from that. Yeah. And kind of understanding of, you know, things aren't just going to go into you from osmosis. It is that, you know, it's what um, Mark McCourt talks about when he does his mastery, you know, it's that contract between the teacher and the pupil and the side, you know, the teacher is the expert and, you know, they will bring those students on that journey, but it's not going to happen just from the teacher. There's that deliberate effort on the side of the pupil that has to happen to make that contract work. And I think one way to get that buy-in from the kids is, you know, tell them these things. Yeah, no, uh, it's really good to hear that because I think we've, we've got maybe north of a thousand pupils and so I'm teaching lots of different classes whenever I'm working with with different groups of teachers and one of the, the, the main caveat whenever I'm working with them is right guys I know that this is new but you remember what you pay attention to so if you if you pay attention to x y and z then I guarantee this will be much easier for you in the long run and, and yeah. I like to I like to explain and um, as you said the sort of the an accessible version of the cognitive science you know so remember what you pay attention to um, and then explaining why things need to be quiet and explain the silent teacher. And, um, you know, yeah, so that, that, that's really good to hear because I spent quite a lot of time <laughs> at the start of the lesson going, so guys, this is why we're doing X. <laughs> yeah, and it's good. I think it, I think it's an effective. And so it goes back to, you bring on that excellent point, yeah, you remember what you pay attention to. That's why I'm doing all of that tapping and stuff during that second model of that silent teacher phase. It's, you know, I want you to think about, oh, he's doing that, he's doing that, he's doing that. I think, you know, when you're talking about planning, I think planning it, planning lessons through what a student's thinking about at each moment is one of the most powerful ways to go about planning a lesson. 
if I'm doing this, what are the children thinking about? If I want them to think about this, what can I do to, you know, instigate that thinking? As opposed to just what is the teacher doing in the hope that, you know, Billy at the back is um, getting anything from it. And you kind of, you know your students, so you then think about, well, I want, I know Shane, who kind of really struggles. I want him to be thinking about this at this time. So what then question am I going to ask? I'm going to ask Shane, because I know he's the one who normally struggles at this kind of thing, at this specific point. And so I think it's a really powerful way to frame lesson planning yeah. through what are children thinking about and what do I want them to get them to think about and how am I going to get them to think about it, not what am I just presenting to the children. Which, which I think is a, is a threshold for a lot of teachers. And, you know, I think I, I definitely went through it myself, you know, moving from we're going to do to we're going to think or we're going to think. Absolutely. You know, because, yeah, because you can spend a lot of time thinking about great activities but actually they may not learn anything. And I think you have to go through that, that threshold when you want to move oh, yeah. towards efficacy. You know, there are certain things that every teacher will think and do because their only experience of school is the t- is when they went to school. And we're, we're quite hopeless at understanding how we learn best. So Absolutely. Like, um, yeah, I think that's quite an important threshold. Um, Game changing. As, as those thresholds. And I'm not sure, I'm thinking about my experience, I'm not sure it's one of those things that can be rushed either I think and you can't just tell someone you can't just tell a teacher this well you can do but that doesn't necessarily equate to the facts that they're going to take that on board because you know I was quite fortunate you know you know Doug Lamov and Teach Like a Champion was thrown upon me I had my own copy and you know we were looking at things like 100% during my NQT year but I just wasn't ready for it yeah wherever I was in that journey, it just has to come at that right point, unless I think you're getting it at the beginning of initial teacher training where they don't have these conceptual models of what they think teaching is. Yeah. You kind of have to let them play out what they've learned, realise, bugger, this doesn't work, does it? Maybe I will go back to that Lamov chap and see what he was about. Oh, okay, in the right conditions, yeah, that it works really well, okay. I'll cast aside those old mental models of what I have about teaching and I'll embrace and learn, attach on to um, these new models. Yeah, what we need are more trust-like step where they're literally training their, <gasps> their teachers from... Sounds next yeah. level. I'm jealous. I'm, I, and I tell that to teachers now as well, that the quality of the stuff that you are having right now is just phenomenal. You don't know it yet. <laughs> because you haven't had because you haven't been through what it was like before but trust me this is if I had trained and know those kind of conditions with these kind of resources that you know people like Matt Swain and um, Charlotte McKenzie are putting out then um, yeah different level yeah absolutely yeah I, I hope they appreciate it I hope they appreciate how good they've got it you know because they literally have a, their sites are you know, they're really, really clearly aligned with what makes a good teacher and what's conducive to teachers staying in the role past year five, you know? Yes. And I think that's really important because I'm very consciously aware that the first two years of my teaching, first two, two, three years of, you know, me teaching were very just turn up and see what works kind of thing. Then it was two years of kind of putting research into practice. And then I got out of the classroom. So I'm very much kind of thinking, right, which is why I do like my role now, because I am able to do little bits of teaching. So, but I'd love to get back into the classroom. I just feel like, oh, like your video, multiple choice, um, weighted multiple choice questions. Like it's something, you know, I'd heard about, read about, never implemented. I was like, oh, I'd love to get in the classroom and like, for me to do that and just like have a term of embedding that and seeing what a difference it makes. And I think that just comes back to the fact that um, teachers aren't rewarded for staying in the classroom financially. Mm. You get, you get to a point, you get, you hit a threshold and rightly or wrongly, I think, you know, financial security is a big motivator for people and they'll chase, chase the money, whether they're, you know, ready for that next step, whether they want to actually get out of the classroom or not. So I think finding ways to 
reward teachers financially for staying in the classroom would be a big step in um, you know, the teacher retention and everything like that. Yeah, because they're almost two different. Like, if you imagine you spend your career getting really good at, at teaching, and then you become a senior leader, and then you're actually more of a I don't know is bureaucrat the right word, but you're you're doing all the administrative. You're an operations guy, aren't you? Yeah, you, the, the head the role of a head teacher is ninety five percent administration. You know, yeah. I think in Asia, in for instance, I know in China and Singapore, you have different, totally different pathways. And, you know, like in Singapore, they've got master teachers who are the teachers who are so good that they work with the pupils who need the most support and they, mm. they demonstrate to other people, you know, this is, this is the way we teach and things. Whereas the head teacher is almost more of um, make sure the school is still running. And, you know, I think they're, they're diametrically opposed, really, because you spend your whole career getting really good at one thing and then you hardly ever do it. When you're in the most senior position in the school, it, it, it doesn't make sense to me, um, and it's probably one of the reasons why, you know, I decided that it, it wasn't for me because actually, teaching and learning, you know, is it's what I'm, is what I'm passionate about. You know, supporting kids, you know, that's where the where the reward is. And I was quite fortunate that the role I'm doing now came up because, essentially, I can teach. You know, I can teach three, four maths lessons a day. You know, mm. helping colleagues, but also working with the children you know and like you know you spoke about lockdown because I obviously there were no classes to go into I got I got really bored doing paperwork you know just obviously started making videos and things to to sort of um, occupy my mind <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but there's nothing better than teaching maths at nine maths at ten maths at eleven <laughs> and then maybe a planning session in the afternoon because you know that's Lovely. that's what you're there for and yes I, I totally see that and I think, um, you know, maybe when I'm, whenever I'm an education minister, I'll, uh, I'll try and make those changes. <laughs> make it happen. Absolutely. But going back to your original question. <laughs> uh, how about I get two models of silent teacher the second uh, time around, you know, pointing at things like, you know, drawing pupils' attention to certain things. Um, Third time around, still silent teaching, um, but very much then an open, you know, question, answer session, you know, what do you still not understand? And, you know, use that AFL opportunities to work out, well, either I need a, a new example or actually we can move on to that we phase where they're working with a little whiteboard, um, working in pairs, however that is set up, give them some time to do it. And then I'll be asking individual groups, right, what's my first step? Okay, fine, great. Another group, what's the second step? Yeah, fine, great. My thumbs up, thumbs down, who got the answer, who worked in pairs and got the answer right. Again, AFL opportunity. So you can then say, you're right, okay, if you got it, here's one for you to try by yourself. And you can go around and do those quick little correctives for those children who are still a little bit unsure. So they're having a go on that whiteboard. So already, you know, you're letting you, before you let them go off on that main task, you in your head already have a really clear idea where you're going to spend the majority of your time supporting to the point where it might be, right, you know, come to the carpet and we'll do some more together. If that's what's needed. Or it might just be, you know, well, you're really clear on, you know, step one, two and three. So get step one, two and three down and then I'll come and support you for step four however it may be so I think I think that gradual kind of control of it all that gradual fading of responsibility to those kids really effective as opposed to just here's an example sometimes not even here's another example before you then send them off and I think that kind of checking for understanding before you let them go is so powerful so you don't find yourself, you know, rushing around and you're going from desk to desk, group to group. And, you know, you're five or six kids in before you realize, you know, the whole thing is going to pop. I need to stop and reset, model again, whatever it is. I think, yeah, that kind of gradual controlling that game. So you know exactly where everyone is and where, how you're going to support everyone else. 
and you're aware of those things before you then, you know, at the end of the day, you then, it's half four, you've just marked 30 sets of English, you've just marked, you know, some wider curriculum stuff, you're onto the maths books, uh, crap, you know, there's eight children didn't get it. By then it's too late. You need to be aware that those eight aren't getting it before you set them off. That, that control you describe, you know, because you, you can release and take it back when you want, um, you know, because you're you're almost letting, you know, bringing them gradually into the bit where they've got full responsibility for for the rehearsal of the of the content. Um, yeah, it makes a lot of sense, but it takes, again, a, a long time to, to get that control and actually know oh, absolutely. The, the messages you're getting from the whiteboards, you know, what is it that's happening here? Um, but definitely, you know, definitely something I think teachers should be should be aiming for, you know, in their practice. Yeah, I think teachers. Another thing that kind of really changed the game for me was just this idea, you know, this novice expert continuum. And actually, you know, when do we decide who an expert, or when a novice is? It's it's a hard one to grasp. I think too early we expect children to be novice to be experts. Well, actually okay, it looks like they're just copying a procedure, but actually, and, you know, I'm controlling them quite a lot, but actually, you know, I'm thinking, you know, circa 2005, 2010, you'd be chastised if you someone came in and saw a lesson like that where you had that much control over them because, you know, you're not letting them deepen their understanding. And, and I mean that in a real kind of superficial way because, they're not deepening their understanding, just fundamentally getting it wrong when they're practicing the wrong thing and it's not helping anyone. So it's that mindset and that change, I think, from saying actually this is what good teaching and learning is because they're at the beginning of this journey. And whenever I get questioned, I was like, well, no matter what you do, the first thing, you, the first step of learning something new is to always copy someone, no matter what you're doing at any level the first thing that you do is observe someone and copy what they're doing. And then you, once you kind of chunked that down and you're happy with that idea, then you start to innovate around it. You don't go straight to the innovation. Otherwise things quickly fall down. Yeah. So it's like the great coaches sort of metaphors that are, that are about, and you know, that, that modeling of those sporting techniques you know I'm, th mm. I'm thinking of something like golf where it's 100 percent technique in terms of how far that ball is going to go you know each muscle has to move in a certain way and you know you're not just going to discover that you know i, I certainly no. discovered it you know <laughs> and probably never will and um, yeah so i think you're absolutely right now what, what would the third feature of uh of a mr allman lesson be oh task design and really making sure that those tasks are something that you know a kid may is really thinking about which is hard and I don't think enough time is um, given to teachers to actually think about proper task design and that may be um, you know the first three or four questions you know may be simple imitation of the method and I think that's absolutely fine and there's you know that's absolutely warranted because that fluency of that method procedure is key further on down the line but I do think there needs to be something a bit more meaty for them to grasp it doesn't necessarily have to be a um a meaty reasoning problem solving activity I don't think um I realise I'm talking to the author of thinking deeply about primary mathematics here. Um, but my reason being for that, or certainly I'll rephrase, it doesn't have to be reasoning problem solving on the content you just taught. Um, one of my areas I'm getting really interested in is this idea of a mathematical um, maturation. This idea that actually, you know, we might need to wait a year or two um, of learning a concept before actually we can do anything massively meaningful with it um, in terms of, you know, solving problems and whatnot. I certainly think um, in terms of task design, I think getting children to think about the possible misconceptions that might come up or giving them something, um, you know, one of those questions where Kieran's attempted this question, this is his answer. Did he get it right or wrong? I think 
after a bit of fluency practice of that, I think that's the kind of thing that children can do. And I think are actually beneficial for, for that thinking deeply without it going too far to the point where we're asking them to solve novel problems in a way that we know they're probably not going to be successful unless there's that heavy scaffolding there. So I definitely think, and that's something I really want to explore a bit more, this kind of task design and everything like that. But I know, and again, going back to, you know, Daniel Willingham and this idea of um, challenge. So I wrote a blog quite recently all about, you know, what does challenge actually mean? Because it's one of those things that uh, a senior leader may quite happily throw at you after a lesson observation and, you know, say, oh, well, you know, the kids weren't challenged. Well, we don't know. You, you, you really don't know unless you, are, you, you can mind read. You don't know how challenging those children found that content and you don't actually know the things that I might have done that on the surface don't look particularly challenging, but actually cognitively the research kind of heavily suggests that, um, you know, there might be some challenge there. Um, certainly thinking about surface structures of problems can, you know, and the deep surface structures of problems. So it might be that all the word problems that I have are multiplication of fractions by an, a whole number, but the wrapper around those, the context that they use might be completely different. And so actually there is that level of challenge between grippling with the surface structure of the problem compared to that deep surface structure and you know being able to untangle all of that stuff shows that there is challenge so there's things like that i think that we can do and something again i never really um thought about much before because one of the and that just comes back to the curse of knowledge we can look at those problems and in our heads we can go oh yeah well that's obviously you know multiplication of fractions or that's you know, this kind of deep mathematical structure but totally different for again for that novice learner yeah um, I think task design is something that I think we need more school leaders who appreciate how important it is and hopefully yeah. as generations of teachers come through um, they'll see because you know for instance I always bang on about high quality textbooks and one of yes. the things one of the things they do is they guarantee the the minimum sequence you know so this is the minimum standard we're going to pitch for but actually it means and i know i say this a lot you're not having to sit down in september and go okay what am i teaching for the next six weeks instead yeah. the question becomes right how do i teach this you know how do i add depth how do what and you know and you could you could write six really carefully chosen questions and have full focus on how deep you want the pupils to go um, rather than okay it's September let's do place value okay what's place value in year four and and you know I, I remember wasting so much time doing that because textbooks in what two in the mid 2000s was was a very dirty word and I'm really glad yeah I think it still is yeah and it, it's one of those ones where people are prepared to die on that hill without ever actually going into lessons where textbooks are used um, because I've introduced it in a number of, introduced a high quality textbook in a number of schools and teachers change, you know, they can be resistant at first because they've only heard the headlines, you know, mm -hmm. no, no autonomy, no creativity, you know, it's going to kill the love of mathematics within six weeks. They're all, this is fantastic, you know, and, and they've got more time to focus on this, the cognitively challenging aspects of their job, which is why we, get into the job in the first place, you know, more or less. Um, yeah, and, so, and I think it, it's in that kind of situation, that kind of environment, that you can say, right, well, let's use half an hour of our joint PPA time to really focus on, you know, multiplication of fractions by a, by a whole number, by an integer. Um, yeah, so I, th I think 95% of schools, you're probably not going to have, that. it's going to have to be in your own time, which is a real shame, because mm. it's probably one of the, you know, when we talk about preparation for our lessons, really, we should be talking about this next level of consideration for the questions we set, you know? So I think I think you're 100% you're spot on. 
yeah, and you've touched on some really interesting things there as well. I'm always, again, as I said, I'm, everything fascinates me about in the world of education. You know, well-being is a massive thing now in schools. Um, so here's a textbook that will, you know, give you some time back. Oh, no, I don't want to use that. It's not creative enough. You know, that, that contradiction there, you know, I want to have, well, if you want to be creative, fine, but then you're going to be using a lot more of your time to be doing those things, whereas there is something here to help you. And with the greatest respect in the world, you know, I I love my mathematics, but I have more faith that the people in um, Aspire Maths are going to produce better questioning sequences than I could ever, you know, come about with. So, yeah, I always find that argument interesting where teachers, you know, that resistance to a good textbook. Yeah, because yeah. at the end of the day, it's, it's there to fulfill the things that you want. So actually it's that probing, actually, what does the teacher want? They just want to do less work, quite frankly. And then that's going to be controversial and I'm happy for you to keep that in. But, you know, obviously you've got to make sure that the textbook is of a high quality because it's not guaranteed. And I can't remember if I wrote it in the book or not, but, you know, the difference between high quality and low quality is negligible. And I definitely said that somewhere before. Uh, you know, so you could end up spending quite a lot of money on something that's not good. But when you've got a really good one in place, you know, it. I can't. I. I don't, I don't understand why you wouldn't choose not to. You know, because um, like you say, some of these people they've got you know teams of many many people specifically sitting mm-hmm. around thinking about question design. I think you need to understand why certain questions have been asked and why things are happening the way they are. And. Um, if you give an example, I had some teachers ask me about the focus on mental methods in year two mm-hmm. and, and, and saying, is, you know, is, is this really important? And I said, well, it's probably the most important thing you can do. And then explained exactly why um, it's the most important thing you do in year two, I think. And then explained why the impact it would have on the rest of their school career and why things had happened in the book the way that happened. You know, so it, they were almost like in. Um, steps that didn't make sense to someone who could already do the method but what they were trying to do was bridge the gap between what was on the paper and what was in the pupils heads you know so the process you go through in your head when you're when you're mentally and so so to someone who knows how to you know add three three digit or three single digit numbers you know it might not make sense to make the bond because you're doing it so quickly and i think it's christopher such talks about you're doing things so quickly that you don't realize that you're doing them you know absolutely and yeah, so I think the, once, once you're guaranteed, you know, you still need to think because I'm, I'm a big proponent of thinking is, is the bulk of our job, really. Um, but yeah, but there's a lot of power. And then and once you've seen why they've done something, then you can start to make that your own in the things that you do. You know? Yeah, and I think you hit the nail on the head there. And I think that's what high quality textbooks enable you to do compared to say schemes that give you worksheets and presentations is that if you're presenting them with a a textbook i think the teacher naturally has to do a lot more thinking about that presentation of the mathematics to the children compared to you know the various um companies out there that provide schemes of work where it's you know here's your powerpoint here's your um here's your worksheet because it can create that environment where, you know, teachers do just come in five minutes before the lesson starts, just download it. And the first time that they look at the maths is when they're presenting it to the kids as well. And you can, you can work out when you, when you're watching teachers, you, you know, when teachers are, have just done that and they've not looked at it the night before and thought about, well, how can I make this work? And what will I, what will I change? Because certainly some of the, um, the quality of the PowerPoints resources that I've seen from some of these companies um, are a little suspect, I think. Is there a fourth part? <laughs> there is a fourth part. Um, a lovely uh, diagnostic question right at the end of the, uh, right at the end of the lesson. So that'd be the last thing um, that I would throw out real quick, a question exactly on what we've been um, working on. And it's kind of like, ideally, 
I, I would have picked up everyone, but sometimes there are just things that crop up and it's all, you know, we, in an ideal world, of course, we'd get around everyone. So this is really like that last kind of safety net of me letting them go out of that classroom, knowing, well, at least they've performed correctly. And again, they may not have learned it. Um, that's what my starter for the next lesson will do to make sure they do remember what we've done before. Um, but it's kind of that last kind of level of safety net before they leave that classroom, actually, can they perform it? So um, for listeners who don't know, diagnostic question is a multiple choice question where um, usually four, an- four um, possible answers and there is uh, three wrong answers, one correct answer, but the, uh, the three wrong answers tend to be just common misconceptions that the children will make about that. So if it's a... Um, in the case of adding, um, sorry, multiplying a fraction by a whole digit number, um, it may be there might be an answer where the numerator and denominator have been um, multiplied. There might be a case where um, you know, the numbers have been uh, the whole number has been added to the numerator, and that's where again going through that process of thinking about you know what are the children thinking, what are the possible misconceptions that they may come up, kind of can help you with that. And so it's a real quick. Here it is on your on you know work out on your whiteboard. And then I used to do uh, oh what I can't remember. I had a nice fancy name for it now. Uh, think hide show. So you know, think about the answer. Then they show me with their fingers you know, one two three four depending on the question on the answer. Hide it from your neighbour. Close your eyes and then show me. And so well that would then tell me you know, really quickly, right, these ones have it, these ones are still struggling. So it might be actually, you know, we always used to have maths just before lunchtime. I'm in my old school when I was still teaching. So I'd always say, right, you know, you three or four will just spend five minutes. Nothing, you know, major, massive, just a real quick corrective before I let, and maybe, you know, one repetition again to see what's um, going on there. And then they'd leave. So at least everyone's left that classroom with a highly likely chance of, you know, I've caught what I needed to catch at the right time. Nice. And I think if you if you execute a diagnostic question really well, you're actually doing a lot of the key behaviours that an effective teacher needs to, you know. So I think, you know, you can almost condense, you know, uh, so it's almost an awareness of those errors that are common and, you know, getting a feel for the fact that not every kid in the class needs the whole intervention, you know, and, and being really refined and well, clinical in, in your, in addressing, yeah. in addressing errors. You know, I think, you know, if a, t- if a teacher just took that and worked on it for a term, you know, they're probably going to be, you know, operating on a, on a pretty high level. level. Oh yeah. And then, you know, Matt Swain comes about and says, well, actually, and you've got 30 kids all just showing you that. What use is that? Get them to do it one by one. So you can be a lot more um, methodic in, um, you know, definitely a way that you could have improved that. Um, I know at STEP they do same day keep ups or their mass lessons before um, assembly. So anyone who, and I think you know, they're um, expected to have a diagnostic question at the end as well. So anyone who doesn't, uh, you know, showing the wrong answer, they have that keep up, so you keep them from the assembly and they do that extra minute of um, extra 20 minutes of mathematics with them, which I think is a really powerful, effective use of time. But I'm sure you're going to have Matt on and he'll talk about that in far more detail than I could ever um, go into. But I was thinking I was doing some training about misconceptions and for um, some research, I was just flicking through, um, I promise this isn't a plug, but I was flicking through your book again. Um, and the idea you have a great little section on misconception and this idea of you know misconceptions you know hit them head on so that got me thinking maybe the end of the lesson isn't the best place for that and actually presenting that at the beginning of the lesson and so you show them that and say right you know here's four answers one of them is right here are three wrong answers i'm now going to show you which answers are wrong and why that is the case. So you're really kind of tackling that head on and so children know. And then at the end, you can show them another one. Yeah. They still do all of that same thing, but actually presenting those misconceptions up front, you know, I'm the 
teacher. I've been teaching, you know, for five years and throughout these five years, there's always been at least two or three kids when I've taught this one who always make these mistakes. You know, why? And so uh, causation correlation, then that tells us, you know, there'll probably be some of you who make those mistakes again. Why wait until after they've made those mistakes before you show them that they may make this mistake? So after reading that section again and doing that training for people that are um trust i'm adding misconceptions to things that are now interested me more a lot more than they used to do and you know when you should go about introducing those and how they can be used most appropriately i think i I probably says for everything there for me there's no there's never a right answer you know because by putting by, by allowing the children to make the error you've almost got the opportunity for that hyper correction you know and you go True. Oh, because and if you if you always address things head on then you're you're never allowing them the opportunity to make those errors so i think it's about in the moment i want to achieve this this is the strategy like like you said when when you really talked about planning and and you had a blog uh, and some training you did for greenwich university and yeah. essentially you had you had your tools and you could draw upon them when you needed those tools. I think that's a, that's a really great, a great metaphor for what we do. So I think, um, yeah, misconceptions, yeah, fascinate me too. Um, particularly the stuff about how we can never get rid of them, and they're always going to be there. Yeah, they're like, always I, there. I can totally feel that. And then if someone compared that to prejudices, um, and I, and I really want to go into that next. And um, you know, you can never get rid of um, prejudices that you that you were given when you're a child and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. So that like I don't know enough about it, but uh, that, that's that's where I'm going to next. You know, maybe not for a book, but definitely for <laughs> personal interest. <laughs> Why not? Awesome. Um, yeah. So I, I reckon you'd see a lot a lot of those things in my lessons too. Um, yeah, I, I I'd like to be in a Mr. Almond math, math lesson, and so I think those kids are lucky. In terms of school leadership, because that's obviously an important part of your role. How do you instigate change on a school wide? level it's uh i think it's really tricky and i think it's hard because not everyone is as you know not everyone's you and so not everyone comes from it with the same mindset as you and so you know you i I come in and i'm you know passionate about everything and it's hard for me to then be like but you're not as passionate as me about, and I get, I do get, I get it now, you know, lives are busy and everything, you know, no one's the same. Listening to people, I think is a big must. Understanding actually what, um, what their understanding of teaching is, what their understanding of learning is, correcting them if there is a massive um, disparity between, you know, what research says learning is and kind of, gently throwing those little nuggets into there as well understanding that you know you're not going to change everything overnight I think so often we talk about working memory in the context of children's learning we don't talk about working memory enough in the context of adult-based learning and school-wide change either you know teachers are remarkably busy people they've got plenty on their plate and so one of the things we can do is take away all that extraneous stuff that they are doing but don't need to be doing to ensure that they can focus everything on improving themselves as um as a teacher i think codifying is really really important and so that's where tools like douglas marv like walkthroughs really really helpful because it just gives you that um that language of teaching and learning and that communication and communication is so important in all kind of organizations but especially in schools because you know you're dealing with human beings and you know young people so it's important that you know that has to be spot on especially when it comes to you know our teaching and learning so it's you know it's great now that i'm at a school a year ago who you know maybe some teachers were cold calling but they didn't know it as cold calling and so now we're giving them this language it just makes conversations so much richer. Uh, so an example, we've got a couple of people who are working on um, deliberate vocabulary development, which is a, a, a walkthrough from Tom Sherrington and Oliver, um, Ollie Cav. 
and so it's just really nice now that you can have people um, cross phase. So we've got people in, uh, you know, key stage two who are talking to key stage one teachers about this walkthrough, and it's you know, about well, you know, what can we do to key stage two, which is exactly the kind of thing they should be doing. So it's very fundamental level. It's just you pick out the key vocabulary, you say it, get the kids to repeat it back, get the kids to say it to a neighbour using the sentence. And that kind of thing, which can sometimes feel a bit, you know, key stage one-ing. I think it still has its merits at key stage two, but I understand, you know. And that, again, comes back to what, as you said, you know, teachers being able to you know, have choice. Um, so if they want to key stage two or five it, then, you know, brilliant. But it's just nice, actually, that, you know, someone in year one and someone in year five can have a conversation and they're on the same page. So I think codifying, um, really, really important. Um, to coin uh, James Carvile's uh, phrase, uh, American uh, political pundit, um, it's the economy stupid, well, it's the teaching stupid. <laughs> You've got to just clear out everything. And again, I'd love to, and maybe I will one day, you know, start, uh, you know, you're starting a school from scratch. You know, imagine there's you know, no systems in place. It's just walls. What is that teacher doing? from the moment they get in to the moment they leave and what is actually impactful on the teaching and learning. And if they're doing something that isn't impactful, get rid of it or find, give it to someone else who should be doing it. So finding ways that we can do that for teachers. Marking is the biggest one. You know, you still go into schools where, all right, maybe, you know, uh, bright side of COVID perhaps has been now, you know, teachers aren't allowed to touch books. So they've had to amend those practices. And I kind of hope that if that is the case, when this is all over, you know, heads have realized that education hasn't gone to pot because they, they're not working, third, they're not writing uh, 30 comments, 30 of the same comments in the book. So why not just read those books, find the good bits, find the bits that could be worked on show them at the beginning of the next lesson. So I always find marking is a good one that you can kind of say, right, you know, we'll take away that burden, but we're not taking time away from you. It's then right now actually use this time to read a book or read this research or you know, attend this CPD or whatever it is. Yeah, well, that's, that's probably about 10, 12 hours a week. You, you give something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> what, what a gift that is. <laughs> 100%. Where I'm quite fortunate is that, um, and again, you know, we've had to change the approach slightly because of COVID. Um, you know, we can walk the walk the talk, so it's all fine and good. You know, a senior, you know, as would normally happen, a senior leader would come into a lesson, say this has to change, but very rarely would they, or certainly in my experience anyway, would they then and say, "I'll teach the first twenty minutes of maths and I'll show you what I mean." Whereas my role is literally say, these are things you should be doing and I'll go into teachers' classrooms and I will show them how those things work. So it's kind of showing them actually what I'm, I, I, know, I know what I'm talking about. So it improves kind of that step, stat is the wrong word, but it's the best way I can think about right now. But, you know, I can do it and I know that these things work. And so teachers kind of see that those things work. And I think that's really important. And again, it's frustrating that COVID's made that harder now yeah but we're finding ways around it which is um you know seeming to be effective right now yeah it, it's, it's it's so powerful because you're you know like you say you're saying i'll, I'll do this you know we'll, we'll, we'll give it a go and um, instead of you need to do this which is a totally different whole totally different conversation you know so i think uh, there's a lot of power in the fact that someone is willing to go into classes and demonstrate. Because I think, like you said, again, with the teaching, you know, when you're getting shown something, there's a, there's a greater chance for you to sort of start making hooks to things that you've you've seen before, or it could be the thing mm. you hook further, you know, stuff onto. So I think, yeah, yeah, 100% really on that one. Yeah, and as I say, tricky right now, but it's getting there. We're enjoying it. And I think the teachers are seeing that change as well and for them it's quite refreshing right it's not someone just saying do this but it's do this oh and i'll be back tomorrow to show you how that works 
and then you know we'll do some right now you know i'll observe you again but all i'm going to comment on and all i'm going to look at is your execution of that technique so unless there's anything massively wrong the only feedback you'll get from me is just on that area that you've decided to kind of um change yourself because i was reading um some work on Thomas Gusky, who obviously done a lot of mastery stuff, but he also looks at um, whole school level change. And he's got some really interesting articles about how um, schools have been doing it wrong and how schools seek to change a teacher's attitude towards something first, where actually the change in attitude only comes from a result of them enacting something and then seeing its effectiveness. And so really the cycle is very much, so, you know, you give some CPD to a student, to a teacher, they try it out. They then infer, has it worked based on um, student outcomes? And then that kind of attitude changes. And I think that cycle is quite useful to, to bear in mind and that you're not going to get that change in teacher attitude straight away you're not going to get those deeply passionate teachers before they kind of gone through all of that first anyway which i found really interesting and so we're kind of i'm working on a little bit of a project and thinking about how we can use our middle leaders more effectively to set up um teacher learning communities which is an idea from uh dylan william so the idea is that these teachers, um, you know, teachers come together in phases for about 75 minutes uh, a month. And the conversations are very heavily based on teaching and learning. And you know, they, they come together and they you know, agree to principles of, you know, we're going to try something out. So they're not accountable for um, to me or they're not accountable to SLT. They're accountable to themselves because they're saying they're promising the teachers in this group, I'm going to go away, I'm going to try this and I'll come back in four weeks' time and I'll report to you how I've done. You can give me some feedback. I'll make notes of that feedback. I'll change and develop my practice. Um, I'll come back in four weeks and let you know how it's going. So it's kind of getting that kind of self-efficient, self-fulfilling cycle going on. That's, you know, me giving these things in these trust-wide um, CPD sessions which is fine, then it's right, actually, where's that level of accountability? Where's that level of teacher engagement where they don't feel like they're doing it because, oh, Neil's here, so I'm going to look like I'm doing it because that's not going to change their attitude. And so by doing that, they're going, that puts them in the situation where they are going to try these things. And the minute they find that it's having that effect, there's that attitude change and then there's that buy-in and then it's like, okay, that's actually is working. And then the enjoyment comes from it because what you're doing is actually working. Yeah. So the machine almost starts powering itself after all. Exactly. And this is why I, I say I have these conversations, you know, if you have a trust of schools, um, you know, what school do you go in first? Do you go into the school that's, you know, doing really badly or do you go into the school that's, you know, doing all right? And I always say, well, I'd go into the school that's doing all right because, you can get those changes and it can become a self-changing machine quite quickly, which then enables you to kind of, right, well, you know, they're fine. They're sorting themselves out. They're on the right. You, you, you drop in and check in and see how they're doing. And then you go to the other school and you can spend the real time knowing that that one's you know, ticking along because it's got those processes and systems in place. Yeah. Which great. I think is maybe quite different to what some people would initially think about. Well, because that one's okay, I'm going to go straight into the one that's, not doing so well yeah uh, but that's a theory anyway i could be proven completely wrong at some point i'm sure no i, I think you need you need, you need to know that um that things are that that plate's going to keep spinning you know because sometimes my work will take me into one class for a really intense period of time you know say a teacher asks me yeah I've been in support for something and we um you know it's almost six weeks of let of one set of lessons gone and so physically, I may not be on site in somewhere else for, for that six weeks. And in my head, I feel it feels like much longer than six weeks when I haven't been somewhere for a little while. And so to know that that plate is, 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 is almost fueling itself and, and 
continually moving forward. Um, you know, is it, I think it's a re, it's a reassurance that you can dedicate your time to the things that are that are most present. If that makes sense, yeah. It, it reminds me a little bit of the success motivation relationship as well. You know, yeah. So it's almost like the success is the enacting you know and seeing the results of, of something and then that, that makes you more enthusiastic towards it want to do it again absolutely reading um the really interesting uh article about um apple which i know we joke about apple quite a lot the technology company um i say one of my obsessions outside of education is is that company and kind of the way that they work um which is really different to the way that most um other big organizations work they very much have a um a startup mentality to the way that they go about organizing themselves so before they used to just kind of have um you know general managers so professional managers come in and i kind of see you know some of our slt can kind of be that kind of a professional manager which i think you know people have there is a place for that kind of thing, but I think for school change and for school innovation and kind of getting that change, actually looking at that startup level is probably a far more effective way of going about it. Um, so one of the things I say, I'll send you the article because I think it's one thing that you'll actually quite enjoy, uh, Kieran, but um, when Steve Jobs, so Steve Jobs got fired and then he had a big uh, comeback and one of his um, changes, he said that... Um, it's a fundamental, a fundamental belief that those with the most expertise and ex- experience in the domain should have decision rights for that domain. And so you kind of then think about, you know, do the people that we have making these changes have that right expertise? And I think it's fine to say, oh, primary school, we're never going to have expertise in everything. But having the confidence for leaders to say, you know what, I'm not an expert in this right now. I'm not going to make this decision now because I don't know enough about it. I'll go away and I'll come back to you is a really interesting um, thought that kind of doesn't, that I think has some merit in the school system. Yeah. It's, it's almost like an extra layer of strength to be able to say, I think so. I don't know enough about this to, to make that decision, you know, and, and defer to those people with the expertise you know absolutely and i think um the other thing that he did so instead of having um compartments of businesses with their own kind of profit and loss structures he brought everything into just one profit and loss structure and now what they say that this did was stop that short termism from um different departments playing off each other and so i thought well actually right now i kind of feel well it's possible that you get those um slt who needs to come in and have whole school impact really quite quickly and so they just bring in those real surface structure layer projects which they get in purely for to tick that off their list so their performance management is going to show whole school improvement in an area so they can find a project from the eef or something else they roll it out and it's normally you know the teachers then who have to enact most of that out because most of those things fall to the teachers for the actual enactment of it anyway but by bringing everything under one kind of profit and loss structure it's kind of saying you know we're all responsible for the final outcomes that we have here and that kind of stops that short termism of i'm you know i need to worry about my targets here and i kind of think that could work quite well in schools as well where actually you know everyone's got the same target which is to get these children to where they need to be and if everyone's on that well, then that might stop those projects that come in. Because I do think sometimes schools shoot themselves in the foot with these, you know, the teaching and learning isn't where it needs to be, but assistant heads and deputy heads to kind of get that impact, start a project which has very limited or very surface level impact on teaching and learning, which I thought was, um, which I think is quite strange anyway. How you can be doing a project on, um, reading for pleasure when your uh, phonic screening is coming out at like 70%, <laughs> maybe spend the time that you're doing that, improving the phonic stuff. 
Um, and the other thing that was really interesting in that article as well was then their three leadership characteristics, which was um, deep expertise of the area that you're in. I and mean, again, I'll give you a, another quote uh, from that um, article. Uh, we went through that stage in Apple where we went out and thought, oh, we're going to be a big company. Let's hire professional management. We went out and hired a bunch of professional management. It didn't work out at all. They knew how to manage, but they didn't know how to do anything. If you're a great person, why do you want to work for somebody you can't learn anything from? And you know what's interesting? You know who the best managers are? They are the great individual contributors who never, ever went to be, a, never want to be a manager, but decided they have to be because no one else is going to do as good a job. I think that's great. Is that Steve Jobs himself or is that a, a general applicant? That's, uh, that's Steve Jobs himself. You can tell. <laughs> yeah, which I just think it's like, yeah, professional managers. It's a, there is a role, I think, for managerial stuff, but. I do kind of agree the best managers are the ones who have that vision and that vision comes from having a deep understanding and deep expertise of something. Um, and the other characteristics they look for in their leaders are immersion in the detail, obvious, and then that willingness to uh, collaboratively debate, and, you know, which I think are, you know, are really great kind of areas of leadership. And if you want to get that school-wide level, you, know, you need to find those people who embody those things or who show willingness to embody those things um i know you know quite a few head teachers and um, senior leaders math leaders are you know showing this wariness now about leadership being a set of generic skills like most things and actually you know the best leaders the best managers you know actually need these three things not just these generic leadership skills and so when I read that article it kind of really kind of spoke to me about you know school-wide change is all about making sure you know you find those people and you find or enable people to become those people give them the time to to do it because I say you know we're generalists so it's highly unlikely you're going to find someone with a massive deep, deep expertise of DT but you know encourage people to try and become that yeah that makes a lot of sense. I can I can totally get on board with those three points. And yeah, I think you know, if I didn't know that was Apple, you'd almost think you were talking about school school leadership and some of those questions. Yeah. You know, that's how relevant I think you know so it's a great find. Yeah, hundred percent um show notes. If I whenever I work out how to do those, <laughs> it's making it available and I'll also read it uh, myself. So your curriculum box set is known the world over. You know, there are a few South American countries that are holding out. Um, Five. <laughs> if you're listening in Paraguay, Bolivia, Suriname. And yeah. French Guyana. French Guyana and Guyana. Guyana. And then, you know, get involved, guys. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but what I'd really love to know is how that idea was because, like, in thinking deeply, I said you're allegorist extraordinary and I was like I wonder how that idea came about you know to tell, tell us about the birth of of the box set idea I wish I knew exactly how it did come about and with all great things it's probably something and you know, I'm not claiming originality in this whatsoever I'm sure you know or Another Steve Jobs quote, you know, all great artists steal. Not that I would classify myself as a great artist. Maybe we should cut that out, actually. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I remember it was Christmas. Um, I had just seen or I just read Claire Seeley's blog about you know, the 3D curriculum. And I think I'd been seeing her at Research Ed Kent a couple of months before and I was just kind of thinking about right okay well this is all fine and good here's a bit of theory like what's it going to look like in practice and I think I remember just as at the time you know Game of Thrones was a big thing Simpsons you know I'm a massive fan of the Simpsons anyway and it just it was just one of those light bulby kind of moments where just, you don't know where the thought the, these thoughts come from but I could just see so clearly how 
school curriculum can kind of can be either like The Simpsons or like Game of Thrones. And kind of from there, I don't know why I was working on science, to be honest. I say I'm, I enjoy science, but I wouldn't say it's my first love of the uh, curric- of school curriculum subjects. Um, well, I think it was came about because I think actually science, I think curriculum is the most disjointed, but actually in terms of its sequencing, um, whoever wrote it for the government did a really, really good job. Um, in terms of how they outline what needs to be in each, um, in the progression from year to year, actually, I think it's pretty decent. But where I think the difficulties come is because they named it things like um, you know, living things, animals, including humans, which when they get to secondary school, die by the wayside anyway. So I think I was just trying to find ways to to tidy that up a little bit. And you know, I read the curriculum and, you know, it made you know, explicit ties to um, explicit mentions to, you know, well, actually kids need to be learning science through, you know, the key disciplines of biology, physics and chemistry. No primary school I've, no teachers, you know, right, we're doing, um, you know, living um, animals, including humans. Oh, by the way, this comes under the strand of biology. And so kind of from there, I started just putting these layers of coherence together until I could really kind of see how this box set analogy worked and how actually what we have is like The Simpsons, but how it could be Game of Thrones. Um, It's always awkward when you done talks like this and people are like it's Game of Thrones well I've never seen Game of Thrones so I normally throw in Line of Duty as well just to uh, appease everyone so that's how it started luckily I think Claire Seeley was having similar ideas at the time and I think I managed to get mine out my blog out just before hers and I know for um, the Academic Roadshow I think it was 2019 or 2018 um Claire did her talk, but very kindly, generously uh, prefaced her talk saying, you know, these ideas have come from the blog that I wrote about it. And I say she did research ads with that talk. She did um, a curriculum conference in, um, oh, where was that? I don't remember where it was, but, you know, curriculum conference, which was, you know, amazing. And I got to see it there as well. Litchfield, it was in Litchfield. And then, yeah, and um, Claire eventually got asked then to, um, of course I have it here, to create the uh, the curriculum guide, uh, the research ed guide to curriculum. And I had a lovely message from um, Claire saying, you know, do you want to spend some time thinking about it, refining it, putting it into a couple of thousand words for teachers to um, to use? And I said, yeah, definitely. Why not? And so that's how it came about. And that's how it ended up in the biggest bookshop in, uh, in the north. And it's fantastic. I've actually got it on the shelf behind me. What, um, what would be the most important message that you'd want people to take away from it? I think this idea of curriculum living on a macro level and a micro level which is a fancy way of saying you, know, you, you have your long-term planning. And so you've got to really be careful and really consider who's planning or who's teaching what topic in each subject. And when it's not because, you know, year four have always done Victorians and, you know, Mr. And Mrs. Whoever, in 4B are going to go mental if they can't teach the Victorians because it's their favourite one. That's not important. It's got to be actually, you know, that and normally I, would, I think I, one of the lines I say, you know, the, before the Ofsted changes around curriculum, you know, the biggest internal power struggles in the staff room were who gets to teach the Egyptians or something like that. Or those, um, those power struggles need to be taken from the classroom and, you know, 
be set in stone and codified and have real clear understanding as you know we are teaching victorians egyptians volcanoes hinduism whatever it is we're teaching it at this point and these are the reasons that we're teaching it at this point so you kind of have that macro level of that long-term plan and a real clear understanding of why then you have that kind of uh, micro level which is more about what that sequence of work might look like so by the end again backward planning at that stage as well what's the end result that you want to get and how many lessons do we have to get there and so you plan out exactly backwards what it is that we need to get from it and that i think just clears a lot of confusion for teachers that idea of backwards planning there's so many good books written about it um And it's, again, it's just one of those things that doesn't make sense when you first hear about it, but once you try it, it just makes so much more sense. Again, the, the popular analogy is, you know, you don't set off in a journey, for a journey before you know what your destination is. And so, you know, this really is no different. So I think that idea of um, that backward planning, and I think that's where um, big ideas as a fr curriculum frame, I think can be quite helpful. And um, I think are um, a nice way of um, enacting that. Because if you have these ideas of what it is you want children to understand, then it's easy enough to work backwards from there to work out well, how am I going to make sure these ideas are achieved. So I know one of the things that I did in the science uh, for example, I took um, Wynne Harlan's ideas of these big ideas of science and I kind of put them down a little bit and, and I made them more suitable for primary. And so if you have, you know, kids leaving pri uh, primary school, the idea that, you know, all living things are interconnected in some way, that bodies are complex systems that need to be taken care of. Everything that you do in your science and those bi kind of biology sessions will work to create that big idea and they all have multiple examples, multiple different um, exposures and different ways, different levels of depth as the years build on, et cetera, et cetera. And I think certainly for the wider curriculum, I think big ideas are a nice way of framing it. I don't know if it's efficacy in say mathematics, for example, I'm not sure, but um, certainly I kind of feel like those humanity subjects lend quite nicely to um, this idea of having big ideas. Um, and with that working backwards comes the idea that, you know, curriculum design is a, it's a whole school enterprise. You can't write, um, if you're a year two teacher, you can't write series two of history if you don't know what the end game is, if you don't know what happened in quite some detail for, in series one, but also what the main uh, subplots are going to be for season one, two, three, four, uh, three, four, five, and six, for example. So it's the idea of actually, you know, you do want teachers to know the curriculum really, really well in all the subjects. And that's going to be difficult. But again, I think there are things that we can do to give teachers time to make sure that they can do that i'm not saying you know they need to know it off you know the top of their head and so you know you you're going to test people and go in right what's the third lesson of geography and year three autumn two but you know teachers need to know where on whatever document system that you're using where that information is and know in a decent level of detail this is what's going to happen so that's definitely one thing um, thinking about concepts, I think is certainly another big takeaway because that's really what ties everything together. Um, a kind of a, as you alluded to, you know, you, you write these things, send them off and then the week it's released, you're like, oh, actually I should have said this. Um, so I'm kind of thinking about the uh, second order concepts and how those would almost like define the genre 
again, with all metaphors, you can push them really, really far. But um, so we'll see how far we can push this one without it becoming a meaningless. So set the second order concepts are really the kind of concepts that define the subject. So define that, that kind of genre. And so in like geography, um, uh, Jackson's 2005 paper uh, alludes to the idea of, you know, space and place, scale and connection, proximity and distance, uh, relational thinking. Whereas in history, it's far more kind of set in stone that it's causation, change and continuity, significance, historical interpretation. So all of those kind of things act in a way to hold these subjects and to define what this box set is, define that genre. But then within that, you have the threshold concepts, which are the um, almost like the themes that can you know uh, crop up in all episodes at any time, um, from series one to series, you know, to whatever that final idea might be. And that's kind of building this idea of shallow learning to deep learning. And so the first um, time you come in touch with that concept, it might be quite surface in level and children aren't going to be thinking that deeply about it. But because you know what that whole journey is going to look like, that idea of um, a concept in, say, um, democracy and history, you, you may start that off actually in reception where it's just, you know, voting on like class rules and things like that. Um, but then you kind of build that in and build it in, build it in, build it in until you know, get to year four and like democracy in Greece and how it was different to democracy now and all of those kinds of things so that you don't want children, as long as this sequencing is there and you've planned for these concepts, it's fine not to push children too deeply, too quick, because their schema is going to evolve over time. So they have all of these ideas of what these big concepts are. I think the final one would be the idea of cross-curricular. I think that's really important for primary schools because as I'm sure you've been guilty of, you're given this generic kind of theme topic. And the idea is, is that every subject for that term then somehow links to uh, links back to, to that, which means you get superficial things happening at best. At worst, absolutely nothing. And so things, and so that idea that a cross-curricular link is something that occurs within the same kind of universe, if that makes sense, of that world that the writers have created. Um, so I don't know what your Marvel knowledge is like, but you obviously had all the Marvel films. Um, but then you had like the TV series Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Channel 4, I think of um, Channel 4. I'm familiar with it. So it was always kind of really clear that although the storylines had nothing to do, they might have dipped in quite nicely. The storylines were still quite separate, but you were fully aware that what you were watching was in the same universe as um, Captain America, Avengers and all that kind of stuff. And so what you're looking for then is those kind of threshold concepts that really kind of can be in history, can be in um, geography, can be in science. So an example might be um, transport as a concept, like transport as a concept transcends history, geography and science because you know, the idea of blood being transported around the body or nutrients being transported around a plant, you know, the history of transport and how transport um, has been changed throughout time, you know, and how transport has you know, changed cities and all of that kind of stuff in geography and how you know, um, ho the concept of a holiday has changed because of, of transport and geography. And so finding those are where meaningful cross-curricular connections really happen. And there may not, and there may not be any, and that's absolutely fine because not everything is connected so clearly. But if you can find a few of those, then I think I even saw your cognitive, you know, you cognitively thinking about that was like, oh yeah, I, I can see how that idea, you know, really kind of just creates such deep, meaningful learning. 
Yeah, definitely. It just makes so much sense. Um, and knowing, you know, and again, it goes back to how you spend your time, you know, knowing that this is the journey the kids are on from what, say three when they come to you until they leave you at 11, you know, and yeah. knowing that you're part of that journey and what your responsibility is. Yeah. then It's a lot easier to invest in that, you know, because if I'm invested in my own planning on the tutors, when I've never studied the tutors because it's not really a big deal in Irish, Northern Irish curriculum. Um, you yeah. Know, I find it harder to invest in my teaching of the tutors than I would in something you provided saying, this is, this is where you are in year say five, you know, and then get involved. Yeah. So that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and do you think there's a book on, on these extended metaphors? Do you have a book in you? <laughs> been asked a few times by yourself and a few other people as well whether there is and the more I've talked about it with you I think there could be some there could be something perhaps who knows I think I think a lot of teachers will benefit you know I think we've got a greater awareness of how good a job we can do and it's just about taking them over the line you know and giving them the tools to to, to, for it to be something that people can realize on a, on a large scale you know me personally mm. I, I think you're the man to do it no oh, it's very, very generous of you no it's fully deserved and um, like i said i didn't understand this stuff um half as much before i'd seen you speak about it and read your your blog posts and things so the the next sort of section we're going to sort of looking at research because obviously we've been to research heads ourselves definitely yeah remember the years but we, we went to, we talked to Comrie together we went to the national conference together a couple of years ago and um, and it's obviously a very important part of both our stories in terms of who we are as teachers um, and one thing I like to ask is about a research thunderbolt so if you think in the golf mm-hmm. part two when Michael <laughs> struck down by the you know the whole world has changed when he meets um, when he meets his, his future wife um, and so if there's a research paper version of that, what, what was your thunderbolt where the scales fell from your eyes and you, a brave new was in front of you? Um, so, yeah, I've chosen uh, 10 benefits of testing and their application to educational practice. And that's by Roy Digger, Putman and Smith. Um, I think it's really, I think it's, it's an important one because of that dichotomy that normally happens about testing, particularly at primary school level. You know, you, I think, except for year three and five, unless anything changes, you know, they're the only um, year groups that aren't going to partake in some kind of high, high stake um, assessment. So obviously you've got phonics screening, SATs, for a couple more years at year two, but they'll go eventually. Year four, you have the uh, times table check at the end of year four, and then SATs at the end of year six. And so from that, the idea of testing gets a uh, a bad rap. Um, and I think it's really important as educators, we kind of make that distinction between um, testing of learning and testing for learning. And this idea of, um, which I've just thought about right now. So Ernest Dylan William has those ones as well. I'm going to copyright those ones. <laughs> um, and the paper, you know, it's not ridiculously um, complicated. Um, it, it's it's written with practicing teachers in mind, so it's really really accessible. But it just lays out really clearly, you know, ten benefits to low what low stake testing actually does at the cognitive levels so in terms of. Um, you know, um, Bjork's um, theory of disuse and uh, storage strength versus retrieval strength and the idea of, you know, actually, if we want kids to remember things, we have to test them. The important thing is getting those conditions right. And testing is just really recalling anything from mind without um, with as limited environmental cues as possible. Uh, so they kind of benefits that they lay out as yeah, the, the testing effect. So the idea, you know, the more you call upon something, that stronger the uh, connections are for retrieval. Obviously, as an assessment tool, we use it to identify gaps in um, children's knowledge. We can then go and um, fix those gaps. Uh, 
Uh, benefit three uh, causes students to learn more from the next study episode. So again, as I alluded to in my what um, Mr. Our math lesson looks like that, you know, we're testing these children beforehand to get their brains, you know, constantly going, get them ready. Um, this idea that um, the more we test them as well, um, it, their schemas develop into more organised and uh, schemas, so information makes more sense to them. Transfer into new contexts. Fascinating enough is that it also um, assists with the retrieval of material that wasn't tested. Um, useful improves metacognitive monitoring. Uh, prevents interference from prior material when, when learning new material provides feedback and if you're doing this long enough and children are seeing the benefits they get into those cycles where they realize testing themselves is a good way for them to you know study independently so it's kind of something before you roll out and this is where I see you know knowledge organizers are the new best thing and you know teachers schools are jumping on that bandwagon before actually developing that testing culture yeah and really understanding you know this is why it's going to be useful not just uh here's a pretty piece of paper with all the facts and stuff and so i think yeah really accessible really useful high quality research paper by some of the best in the business on them um, on retrieval and memory so i can see why there'll be a thunderbolt because again tests and very emotive if you've been through the system but not understood the system then yeah, your your default is almost going to be negative, and then all of a sudden you realise that testing kids and multiple choice questions, which normally get derided in the media, you know, like in the Simpsons, you'll see, you know, multiple choice questions being given or pop quizzes, and it's and it's yeah, they're they're a source of derision, but actually, they they end up being one of the most effective things. But you know, and, and papers that explain that kind of awakening, you know, hundred percent. I'd say. Oh yeah, complete clarity. And as I say, you could take one of those things. You know, there's a two-year research project for someone who's doing an MPQSL, just looking at those things right there, and making sure staff are aware and changing that culture around testing. And I'll say, I think, in terms of student well-being, the reason they get so, um, or one of the reasons, you know, why. You know, report about you know poor well-being and stuff when it comes to do tests is actually because they don't do enough of them yeah i can see that and so obviously if they go in there feeling confident and they know well you know it's just another test and we've been we do tests all the time we just call them quizzing they're going to go in far more confident than perhaps they would do otherwise but yeah, that's certainly one that because I was definitely at the beginning of my uh, you know teaching career. Wouldn't say anti-testing, but yeah, um, certainly you know <laughs> limit it and you know in primary school let them you know. But actually, it's a really effective, useful tool. So I was making sure you know any spare minute moment that it was in my classroom, it was just you know quizzing 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 and the kids loved it you just make a little competition between themselves you know how much did you get last time yeah. how much did you get you know this time as long as you beat your last score then fine and things like um you know when you boil down um timetable rock stars <laughs> effectively it's just a quizzing platform yeah and you know i've not i've yet to met a single child who doesn't enjoy timetable rock stars when they're using it yeah they've, they've hit the magic formula you know bruno has done a fantastic job because the kids really want to play it and the teachers really want their kids to play it because if they know those times tables by the end of year four you know life is so much easier from there on out you know oh massively so year five six even all the way up to year 11 you know so i think that they've done a great thing and like you say we we want them to do it because of that test and in fact because of that retrieval you know and because we know that it's going to be beneficial you know for its application to other ideas bigger ideas you know more ideas with more parts and um, when it comes to the maths curriculum but equally the kids love playing it too you know i think you're right and i think um quizzing is reasonably a big part of many lessons across the schools i work in and you know the kids 
they they want to, you know like you said they want to improve on what they did before and then and when we explain you know this is why we're this is why we're doing this quiz this is why we're doing this test then you know they're fully on board with it you know I don't know. oh yeah I was going to say as well this is another like the testing effect I must have done a twenty minute introduction to that to a bunch of eleven year olds be like right I've read about this bad news for you is that I'm going to be quizzing you a lot more now but this is why it's going to be really low stakes half the point i'm not going to um ask you what you got out of 20 because it's not an assessment tool for me i'm using this now as a learning tool for you and i think making that distinction between using testing as a learning for the students and to strengthen those um connections rather than a, an assessment tool is, uh, is an important distinction for educators to have and make. Right, so the, the last bit, um, and obviously this is for people watching on YouTube more than anything else, is the tier list, um, whereby we rank different, different things based on your interpretation of them. So um, S is almost your seminal or, you know, your the thing that you are most a fan of anything below yep. anything above b being above is sort of a respectable position and then c is almost sort of like a you know an, an afterthought and so because of your passion for knowledge and i've gone for different things that teachers might teach in the foundation subjects Okay. And you're going to tell me okay. where you think they should go in the in the tier. Okay, so the first one it is dinosaurs. <sighs> dinosaurs. That's going. That's going straight to C. No need for it straight whatsoever. To <laughs> straight to C. I can't possibly. Often gets thrown in with that. It's, um, Stone Age to Iron Age topic uh, curriculum aim, and I've no idea why because there's about sixty five million years between them. <laughs> oh, that, is, that is ridiculous. <laughs> Things that happened a it, long time ago. Interestingly enough, you, if it's anywhere, it tends to be um, early years. Dinosaur is quite a common one. Well, certainly used to be anyway in the early years. Whether or not it still is, I'm not sure, but but no, definitely a C. C, excellent. So number two, and based on that response, I can almost guess where this one's going. Oh, this one's pirates. Oh, pirates. Pirates go. <sighs> it depends where else your curriculum is going um i've written a blog about why we do pirates it's well, again one of those ones i think hails back from like the qca days uh and one of our schools choose to keep it fine um so we've got quite a lot of links in there where, where it can be effective in terms of how powerful it is I mean, if you think about the uh you know, time is our greatest currency. Is spending half a is half a term on pirates the most efficient use of spending that time? I'd say probably not. So I'm going to go for a B on that one. B. Oh, that's not too bad for the can work, but I think you need to make sure everything else. There's got to be a reason for it being there. Yeah, not just because it's fun. <laughs> not just because it's pirates. <laughs> Although interestingly enough. Um, in our scheme of work, um, we do go into Blackbeard and, you know, what he got up to. Um, and the last person who won a million pounds on Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, the question was, um, you know, what year did Blackbeard die? And I was like, that's not year two curriculum. They'd know that. So maybe it needs to uh, go up a level just for that. But we'll keep it there for now. Stone Age, great topic. Uh, compulsory and I think I'm going to go S for that 
I'm going to go S because I started watching um, over lockdown um, uh, The Ascent of Man. Classic. And um, one of the first two episodes is just all about how much of an impact that moment from nomad to hunter-gatherer to farmer and just how fundamental some that we take for granted right now had on human civilization and human impact of the world. It effectively gave us the time to pursue all these other pursuits, which is how we got here right now. So yeah, really important. And again, one of those things that fundamental but seems so blasé and unimportant but is massive so do you, do you teach that later on because of its importance and because of how much there is to it or do you teach it earlier on no we teach it early on we go year three for that one year three um because because of its importance i think and so what we get from that is the idea that when they come to all those other civilizations they know that even though their Stone Age, Bronze Age, and other parts of the world would have happened at different times, it's still the same process that has happened. That idea of going from nomads to hunter-gatherer to this agriculture, agriculture society yeah. is what made the Egyptians manage to spend their time building pyramids. It's what gave them the time to, uh, you know, without that happening, we'd have... You know, hieroglyphics and the importance of language and you know, writing and all of that stuff probably wouldn't have happened. So we get that in early on. And I know um, Victoria Morris, Mrs. S on uh, uh, Twitter, we will, um, this is why we, we would never be able to work together because the depth of our conversations would literally be about where does this one topic deserve to be, which I think is great. I think that's what the kind of conversations that, you know, schools should be having yeah. in the, uh, you know, at the levels of curriculum design and you know we still can't I think we're both pretty st stubborn and stuck in our ways as to where we would put it um and I also like especially because it's um stone age to iron age in Britain uh in our curriculum it the last lesson is looking at the um stony um iron age tribes and our first lesson of the um Romans is the Roman invasion coming over and nice. battling a few Iron Age um, tribes as well. So there's that link there to it as well. And that overlap, which so far seems to have worked well. That's superb. And yeah, and just listening to you now, I can, you know, that is a really powerful, powerful piece of our period in history, isn't it? And, you know, it, it take. To do that justice, you need a lot, a lot of knowledge about. Oh yeah, about, about history. So um, yeah, I've got, I've got a colleague. Um, I think he tweets under teacher on bike. Um, a guy called Jack Harker, and he does the same. Where he has his last, his last lesson on the tribes leads into his Roman. In yeah, I think it's a really powerful way of getting that overlap. When you're thinking about. Um, Obviously, the work you've done with um, the idea of story as well. If your last lesson tells that story from the perspective of the British tribes and your first lesson on that Roman topic tells the same story through the perspective of a Roman invader, yeah, powerful teaching tool. That is. That, that's, that's the kind of stuff you're going to remember. Okay, the next one is the Tudor period. We got Henry II. Oh, Tudors. I love the Tudors. Not compulsory. Um, to get this one in, you've got to use the that cheeky objective of uh, some change in British history from 1066 onwards, um, which to my shame, I have used to plug a lot of rubbish in the past. <laughs> um, but it's got to be an S for me as well. Love the Tudors. Fundamental, uh, the religious changes, um, yeah, you know, the how we got here. You know, the amount of um, 
kids who go to C of E schools who have no idea, you know, why C of E is even there. Massive. Um, yeah. yeah. Definitely yeah. an S. Yeah, I think just in, in much the same way as the Stone Age, the world is what it is because of... Because of the Tudors. During those, those sort of few hundred years. Uh, and then ancient Greece, I think this is. Ancient Greece. I'm going to go S for that one again. Reasons, again, just the links to everything. It's one of those real nice ones where you can really look at, you know, advanced civilizations hundreds of thousands, you know, thousands of years ago. Um, some lovely. Um, I can't remember the, the name exactly, but you know, you can do lessons about you know philosophy. You can do, you know, how you know you might remember his name better than I will. But the the Greek mathematician who was able to calculate the circumference of the Earth just by using you know sticks and shadow, and he got one of his colleagues to look at how long the shadow was in Alexandria compared to where it was somewhere else in Egypt and you know, the level of mathematical thinking and that's kind of and I think there's a massive I think a really great history unit would be mathematical thinking and development as a history unit would be a really interesting really exciting one to have so you know maths isn't just this thing with number it has its own complications. It has its own histories. It has its own internal conflicts. You have the, you know, Christianity. You have you know the Christian scientists of like in the West versus like the the Middle Eastern mathematicians as well, and you know what was going on with them and how you know lots of the ideas, you know, so that idea of you know historical interpretation. Well, why is it you know that we remember or that we know more about you know the mathematical achievements of Western civilization compared to, you know, the mathematical achievements of the, the Middle East and, and Baghdad and all of that stuff would be a really interesting uh, historical unit to tie these ideas that they're learning, um, you know, or they have learned together would be really, really great. Well, we'll see what number six is and then if there's time at the end, I'll, uh, depending on what this one is. Oh, it's, uh, is Vincent is representing artists. <laughs> <laughs> Vincent is representing artists. So, so the idea that uh, we we need to study artists in depth in key stage one or key stage two. We need to study artists in depth. I think there's some benefit to it. So I'm going to go a because I think. If you can craft a scheme that looks at artists in depth along with the artistic movements and along with the you know, the social and cultural histories that were going on in that time, it just makes those paintings or the pieces of art that they produce so much more interesting and so much more intricate and so much and you just have greater appreciation I think when you realise actually because you can appreciate something because I'm rubbish when I go to art galleries and it frustrates me that I'm rubbish when I go to art galleries because I want to know more about it and I can appreciate the piece of art in terms of the artistic skill that normally means looking at it for about five seconds then being like oh that's a nice painting I'll move on to the next one but if you can really understand, you know, someone's life, what was going on in that time in the world and everything like that, I think it just puts a new kind of lens to how you see things. Because all artists, you know, it was all there for communication and typically it was all an anti-establishment kind of stuff and you know, the messaging behind it. So to get that full appreciation, I think you kind of have to teach that kind of thing. Otherwise, it just becomes a a pretty picture and a pretty painting. The difficulty you'll have, of course, then is making sure that um, 
you know, you've got a, a good, diverse, it's very easy again, I guess, to move into that dead white men kind of uh, artistic nature. So important to get that diversity while at the same time making sure that they're there because their work of art warrants it, not just because um, you know, human characteristics. So I say, I think Mary Maya, fewer things, greater depth, perhaps. I think my ideas for art would be, at primary level, would be choose two things and make sure they leave year six being able to do those things really, really well. And then some of the other parts of it can come from that art history side of things, choosing some key movements, key artists within that movement where possible. You know, you might want to look at Holbein and self-portraits in the Tudors because um, Henry sent, um, Holbein did Henry and Henry um, sent Holbein off to paint Anacles. We all know how that all, um, how that all ended and stuff like that. So that's my lesson for that answer for that. That was a tricky one there at the end, Kieran. <laughs> Nice. Um, it's been absolutely fascinating to listen to you, Neil. Um, and I could, you know, if I had a choice, I'd go on for even longer. But um, you know, we really appreciate you taking the time to talk about some of the things that are important for primary teachers. I think no to, worries. To be thinking about. Um, yeah, no, it's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. And there we have it a truly fascinating chat full of superb insights into the world of primary education. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, follow or leave a review, depending on where you're listening. And if you have any questions for any of my guests, head over to the Thinking Deeply About Primary Mathematics YouTube channel and leave a comment and let the conversation continue long into the night. Until next time, thanks for listening.